We're going to look at Luke 10, 25-37 today, the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is an example of telling a story that your audience doesn't want to hear. Telling them something that is repulsive to them, something that they don't like in order to make a point. So, let's take a look. We're going to start by reading verses 25 to 29. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Let's pray. Father, give us grace as we read this. This is not necessarily something that we are repelled by. So it's going to be difficult for us to understand. Let your spirit open our hearts and our minds. Help us to grasp what's here. Help us to understand so that we can better live for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is my neighbor? Is the question. Now, this is not... There were several times in, in the in the New Testament where scribes or members of the Pharisee party came to try to trick Jesus or try to, you know, put get him to say something that they could get him in trouble with. This is not one of those times. This is a, a sincere exchange. Expert in the law is a scribe. He's someone who spends his time reading, tra- writing. He, he's pretty good at knowing what's in the Torah. And scribes themselves often dealt with what should I do questions. And so he comes to Jesus and when it says he's testing him, that is not trickery. That means putting him to the test. It means checking him out. How's he going to answer this? And so when Jesus said, how do you read the law? He answers Jesus from the Torah, the law. He quotes from Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19. 18, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the scribe's answer is exactly the same as Jesus taught. Love God, love others. When Jesus then responds to him, do this and you'll live, he responds with an Old Testament quote. It's Leviticus 18.5. Do this and you will live. This is two professionals talking to each other on a professional level. They're speaking to each other through the law. And that's how the professionals deal with it. When Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, this is not just some sort of touchy-feely New Testament, you know, let's all sing Kumbaya and be happy. This is exactly from the beginning. In the harsh Old Testament, what God has told us to do. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so it's not some new thing to make you feel good. It's what God calls us to do. It's what God does. He loves you as himself. He loves his neighbor as himself. But now the scribe kind of faces a dilemma. How do I know if I'm fulfilling the law or not? Now, you might think, well, come on, he just told you what to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, how hard is that? But when he says he wanted to justify himself, you're seeing human nature there. What's the definition? Who is my neighbor? Where do I draw the line? Where do I even start? How do I know? And and he's being serious here. He's He's not looking for a loophole. He wants to know. What does that mean exactly? And being a scribe, he wants to know exactly. Is it just myself, my wife, our son, his wife, us four no more? 
or is it bigger than that? All right, let's take a look at verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he had come to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he took the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now remember, Jesus tells this parable, this story, to answer the question, who is my neighbor? That's his point. That's what's going on. So don't look at all the little details there. Look at what the point is. Who is my neighbor? Well, the setting of the story, it, it's sadly common. Jerusalem sits at about 2,600 2, feet of altitude above sea level. Jericho is at about 840 feet above sea level. So it, he's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a 20-mile trip. The altitude changes 1,300 and better feet. It's dangerous. It's a twisty mountain road. They didn't have grading equipment to make it a real good road. And so thieves always seem to know where the easy spots are. And they're sitting there waiting, and this guy's just another crime statistic. They rob him, and they're not happy with just robbing him. They beat him half to death and then leave him, leave him behind. Well, everybody in Jesus' day who heard that story, especially if they had ever gone from Jerusalem to Jericho, would go, mm -hmm, yep, I wouldn't have gone there. Wouldn't catch me making that trip alone. So, everybody understands the setting of the story. But then, things start to change. A priest and a Levite approach. They come up the road, and they see this guy lying there, and they go on the other side of the road, pass by. When I, one of my college textbooks, my, my uh, psychology textbook, told a psychology experiment that some guy did where he brought seminary students in to interview him for a job. And what they, he set them up, because he made them pass through this alleyway, and in the alleyway there's a guy laying there going, oh, 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 help me, I've just been beat up. Most of the seminary students did exactly what the priest and Levi did. They passed him up and went by. Now, i got to tell you, having been a seminary student, uh, they seminary students have less reason to do this than the priest and the Levite did. Because for the priest and the Levite, if the guy's dead and they touch him, then they're, they are now ritually unclean and they can't do their job. And if they're going from Jericho to Jerusalem, assuming they're going to the temple to do their job, uh, well, you've got a dilemma here. What's more important, religious duty or compassion? Well, it's a trick question. Both of them are important. But Jesus is illustrating the question, who is my neighbor? What's more important? Perhaps compassion is the greater duty. Perhaps somebody else could do the job and you could do what's right, which is Jesus' point here. Well, then he comes on to, somebody, somebody said that the reason the, the priest left him by on the other side of the road is because he could see he was already robbed. <laughs> um, so then we come to this uncommon night of the road. Now, even though Samaritans practiced Judaism, they were considered unworthy half-breeds by the Jews. Jews did everything they could to ignore them or to snub them if they had to deal with them. And you will see, when you read the Gospels, 
where many times Jesus and his disciples going to Jerusalem or Galilee, they'll cross over the Jordan and, cr and go up the other side of the Jordan River and then cross back over into either Galilee or, or uh, Judea to bypass Samaria, where those evil half-breeds were. Now, Samaritans practiced Judaism. They considered themselves Jews. But the good Jews didn't. Does this sound familiar in any way at all? Because it ought to. This is a common human thing to find some reason to elevate yourself so you can snub somebody else. And so Jesus takes this hated Samaritan and makes him the hero of the parable. Now, see, you and I hear that and we go, oh, yes, Jesus, Jesus. You put those people in their place. What if I change that to a Mormon missionary on his bicycle came up that road and stopped and helped this guy? Would that come any closer to home to you? How about a gay couple came up that road and stopped and helped this man? How about anything that you don't like? Anything that tweaks your a member of the opposite political party came up that road. <laughs> because Jesus wanted you to go, ow, not him. He couldn't, he, he'd never do something that good. Because those are all jerks. That's what he wants to elicit from you when he tells his story. He wants you to jump back like you've just been pinched. No. Matter of fact, I would think it would be easier for you to name someone I didn't like than it would be for you to name someone you didn't like. It's, it's, it's much easier to not see the people you don't like the most. So anyway, this Samaritan sees this man lying beside the road, and he's not motivated by culture or class or status or duty. He is motivated simply by compassion. He stops and he helps the man. And he goes, as Jesus said in other places, goes the second mile, goes beyond. He doesn't just bandage the man by the side of the road. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to an inn, cares for him for the day. And when he leaves, he leaves money behind if there's anything else and says, I'll square it for you if there's more needed. Way beyond what he has to do. I mean, you could stop and give the guy some food and make sure he's bandaged and then say, I hope you're okay and leave. And you know what? Most people would say that was pretty good of you. But this guy does, you, there's no questioning him. He's a marvel. He's a hero. Verse 36. Ouch. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, there's not a lot of room for me as a preacher to add to that, but since I'm a preacher, I will. <laughs> Which of these three was a neighbor to this man? There's no room for doubt. The question is no longer, and Jesus is good at this, he's twisted it from, who is my neighbor to, am I neighborly to those I meet? He switched it from the other guy right on to me, right on to you. In other words, neighbors don't are, neighbors do. And that's what Jesus is doing to answer this guy's question. Who is my neighbor? He's turned it back on. You can't wait for somebody else over there to be a neighbor. you got to do. you got to act. And the New Testament is full of this. God is less concerned with your sign, with your bumper sticker, with your pen than he is with what you do. Well, who's my neighbor? Well, obviously, 
it's the bad guy. Now, notice this poor scribe, he can't even say the word Samaritan. The one who had mercy on him. <laughs> the Samaritan put love into action, not into sentiment. Now, I once heard a teacher say to me, he said in our class one day, I, I've come into school this morning, I saw a hitchhiker standing in the rain. He said, I had compassion on him, but I didn't stop. That's not compassion, that's sentiment. Oh, poor guy. Glad I'm not out there. Sentiment is easy. And you can make yourself feel better that way. Oh, that poor guy. Sure hope God does something for him. When in fact, maybe God did something for him. He sent you there. And not just to drive by, but to do. To be a neighbor. And so the answer to the question, who is my neighbor, is you go and do likewise. You be a Samaritan. You take care of somebody who doesn't ever expect you to do anything for them. Who, as a matter of fact, if they expected something from you, would be to pass over to the other side of the road to your side so you could kick them on the way. And change that equation. Be a neighbor. Now, Doing good deeds is not going to save you. As a matter of fact, in this con in this context of helping this guy out, see, we would all, if I'm the Samaritan, pat on the back, Don, Don, you are so wonderful to help that guy. Where God's attitude is, what do you mean? That's the right thing to do. Why would you expect any special praise for doing what's right? So, I mean, doing good deeds is not going to make God go, oh, Oh, I'm so blessed. Oh, he's going to say, right, you did the right thing. But I will put it the other way. Refraining from doing good deeds shows that you don't know the Lord at all. You don't have a heart for people. You don't have heart. You don't love God and love people. If you don't do what's right, all you really love is yourself. But doing what right, what's right sometimes costs you. Cost you a ride up a hill on a donkey. Cost you a couple of denarii. Cost you. Cost you time. This parable teaches that God expects us not just to know His Word, but to live His Word. To do what He says to do. And in, in, in this instance, Jesus is really giving a good description, a good picture of what the golden rule means. Do unto others as you have others do unto you. If I was lying by the side of the road, beat up and naked, half dead, I sure would hope somebody would do something for me. And so why could I convince myself that it's not okay to do something for someone else? Well, they're different. They're from that other group. I hope they're hurting a lot. But let me finish with the last thing. Jesus says to the guy, go and do likewise. He expected the scribe to live the word. He didn't encourage him. He didn't plead with him. He simply told him to do it. And, and there's no equivocation or anything else. Because this guy was seeking to live for God. And he had a legitimate question. And he got a legitimate answer that rings 2,000 years down the ages to us. Because this is something we all struggle with. So what about you and me? Go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how powerful it is in showing us your expectations, but also, Lord, in showing us your love for us. Help us, Father, to live that so that other people might see your love as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.